Hi, I want to talk to you about what's happening in America right now. In order for us to get into the solution, we need to have a different frame of reference for politics. We need a visionary politics. It's a holistic politics. It talks deeper than just the level of the symptom, just the level of what's happening at this moment. We need to have a strong intellectual uh, realization of the factors involved, and that begins with a historical understanding. In order for us to create a way forward for our country, we need to bring all of ourselves to politics. We need to bring a deep um, understanding, deep thinking, and also we have to bring very expanded hearts. So in order for us to have an understanding of what is happening racially, and also in order for us to start developing the kinds of solutions that will actually fundamentally repair things, we need to go back and start at the beginning. The first slave ship was brought to the United States, which wasn't even the United States yet, in 1619. So let's just really remember that black Africans were not brought to the United States as conquering hordes. They were brought against their will in the most cruel and barbaric way possible. You can certainly read or watch movies about the passage and how horrible it was. But then also they were brought here uh, to be abject slaves. And if you haven't read about slavery, if you haven't watched any of the really fine films and documentaries that have been made, it's probably a good idea for you to do that. Too many people, it seems to me, haven't really taken in fully emotionally what it means that we had in this country almost 250 years of abject slavery. So the first slave ships came over in 1619 and slavery was not abolished until the end of the war when the Civil War was won by the North in 1865. Slavery was what it was until the 19th century when the cotton trade in the South became such a major uh, inter business enterprise and that's when slavery really, really revved up. It is believed that at the end of the Civil War, there were between four and five million enslaved persons. Okay, so 600,000 Americans died in the Civil War, which is so humongous, particularly given what a smaller population we had at that time, just to compare 257,000 uh, uh, Americans died in World War II. Almost 600,000 died in the Civil War. This was a profoundly devastating experience. But let's talk about external remedies and what they can and cannot accomplish. The stroke of a presidential pen on um, a signature on the Emancipation Proclamation even the surrender at Appomattox concluding the Civil War, even the 13th Amendment which abolished the institution of slavery, all of those things, while extremely important, could not get rid of racism. They could get rid of slavery, the racist institution, but in a very real way, if anything, it pushed racism even further down into the psyche of certain Americans. And let's talk about why that is. Okay, it was in Beaufort, South Carolina, during my campaign, I actually visited Beaufort. And in Beaufort, South Carolina, there is a grove of trees. And we don't know exactly which tree uh, the general read from, but that was when uh, formerly enslaved people were told for the first time, you are free. Now think about this. Once again, bring your whole self into this. So you have been a slave and your grandparents were slaves and their grandparents before them were slaves. And you were told that you were no longer a slave. It's, it's such an overwhelming thing to even consider what the emotion of that day would have been. As a matter of fact, it's a historical fact that to me is so fascinating. Some cruel, horrible person uh, or people had told uh, had spread the word that you could not be emancipated unless you were actually at that spot in Beaufort. So there were all these people in boats, you know, on the river trying to get to that spot. You're told you're no longer a slave. One can't even imagine the emotion of that. However, where are you supposed to go? And what are you supposed to do now? Well, General Tecumseh Sherman said, that every family of four 
formerly enslaved people would receive 40 acres and a mule. You know, we all, we've all heard that phrase, but I want you to please think about what that actually means to people who don't know where they're supposed to go or what they're supposed to do. You're gonna have 40 acres and you'd have your own mule. This would be the beginning of your ability to make a living. And remember, a lot of those 40 acres would have to, by definition, be taken from people who had lost the war. So even though the South lost the war, think for a moment about the psychological and emotional conditions at that moment. This is why when Abraham Lincoln says, and I, I urge you to read the second Lincoln's second inaugural address, with charity for all, with malice towards none malice towards non-charity for all. Lincoln was adamant that the South would not be treated like a vanquished enemy, but that the South would be treated like a brother who had come home. If Lincoln had lived, things might have gone very differently actually, but he was assassinated shortly after the end of the war. After the Civil War, federal troops were sent and um, uh, remained in the South to guarantee that slavery as an institution would not be reinstituted. And during that 12 years, there really was a bright and shining moment of possibility. Uh, black senators, black congresspeople were elected, but a lot of the vanquished Southerners and also there were the carpetbaggers who came down from the north. So you had people who had already been beaten who were beaten down even further. And think about it, somebody has been your slave. I mean, think of just the profound cold dehumanization that one has to experience to even own a slave. And now that's turned into abject hatred because I used to have a life and I don't know you do. You know, let's bring our our psychological or emotional understanding to all of the factors that, that underlie the turmoil that has lasted all these years. So during those 12 years, there was that bright and shining moment of possibility. Once this, the federal troops left, that was a period called Reconstruction, by the way. Once they left, all hell broke loose because many people in the South had really just held their breath until those, those troops were gone. And at that time, the uh, white Southern legislatures in, throughout the South passed what were called the Black Code Laws. The Black Code Laws guaranteed subpar economic and social and political opportunities for black people. Now, this is where Jim Crow, this is segregation. So, you're talking about 250 years of slavery, then 12 years when <clears throat> some healing could begin, then that stopped, and you're talking now about the reinstitution. Although they could not reinstitute slavery, they did institute segregation, which is institutionalized white supremacy and institutionalized violence towards black people. Think about what lynchings were. Think about what Ku Klux Klan was. This, this is institutionalized violence. This is domestic terrorism. That did not end until the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. I, when I think about this, I was born in 1952. The Civil War wasn't over until 1865. That was less than 100 years before I was born. This is America's recent history. So, in, 18, in 1865, the, war, the Civil War ends. It's not till 1964 that the Civil, Rights, uh, the Civil Rights Act is passed, desegregating, dismantling segregation. And then in 1965, that was in 64, and in 1965, the Voting Rights Act, because the Voting Rights Act was extremely important to guarantee that uh, blacks would have universal access to voting rights, and, and of course this covered all Americans. That, by the way, 
they, the Supreme Court started chipping away at in 2015, which is why we have all the voter suppression problems that we have today. So now we're into 1965, making progress. You know, I remember when I was a little girl being at the Medical Towers building in Houston, Texas, it's still there. And I remember there's a sign in between the elevators on the floor where we were at the doctor and it said, colored bathrooms downstairs. And I remember asking my mother, mommy, why, what does that mean? And I remember my mother explaining to me what it meant. We have to educate our children about all these things. Night after the voting, uh, after the uh, Civil Rights Act of um, uh, 1964, such signs could no longer exist in public buildings, etc. 1968, Bobby Kennedy, who was very, very beloved uh, when it came to racial issues, and Martin Luther King were both assassinated that year, and Richard Nixon was elected president. Richard Nixon had a, an advisor named Patrick, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, or Patrick Daniel Moynihan, I think. He later became a senator from New York, but he was an advisor, a domestic advisor to Nixon. And he coined the phrase, benign neglect. And what Moynihan's advice to Nixon was, enough with the 60s and the protests and all the stuff about race and Martin Luther King, we now need a period, Americans need to rest, enough is enough, and he coined the phrase, benign neglect. Also, Richard Nixon came up with this whole law and order thing, the whole drug thing, drug war, none of which was necessary. We didn't even really have a problem. It was all sort of invented for political purposes. And that started a well, it's not so much that it started as it stopped something that was on on the move. And there was at that time, and I'm not romanticizing um, our history, but there was a general consensus that you felt it in the air. There was a general social consensus on the both left and right that America was supposed to do better and that the people who wanted racial progress, and this was the way the Republicans talked, it was the way the Democrats talked, it's a sense that those who wanted things to be better were on the right side. There was, a, there was a moral center. And there was also a sense that anybody who was a rabid racist or bigot should be given no megaphone by either the Republicans or the Democrats, right or left, that that was not okay. It's not that it didn't happen, but that the, we thought that we had reached a consensus because I think for a while we had, and there were levies. And now, as we know, those levies have fallen. They have fallen for two reasons. First of all, because we have nothing less powerful than the President of the United States, who has given wink-wink in places where no one could have even imagined a wink-wink would be given by a President to people who are openly white nationalists, white supremacists, etc., and also, of course, social media. And so, with starting in the 1980s, when this profound, massive uh, transfer of wealth began to happen, whereby major resources of the country were moved further and further into the hands of a small group of people to the point where we have 1% of Americans who are uh, controlling more than 90% of the wealth of the United States, who was going to be hurt the most, but those who were the most politically, di uh, economically disadvantaged. Now, Let's go back to what happened in 1964 and 1965, because in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act dismantled segregation, and the next year, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, those were two factors out of three that it was understood needed to be addressed. Number one, you've got to dismantle segregation. Number two, you've got to uh, make sure that people can vote. And number three, address the economic gap. Now, that I think that we would all agree from a moral place. If you've been kicking people to the ground and 350 years of institutionalized violence, I think we would all agree that's kicking people to the ground. 
But we would also, all people of goodwill, agree that if you've been kicking someone to the ground, you have a moral responsibility to do two things. Number one, stop kicking. And number two, reach out your hand and say, here, let me help you get back up. So what has happened is that the economic gap, obvious economic gap after the uh, end of the Civil War, but then after another hundred years of subpar, as I said, not only subpar political opportunities, subpar economic opportunities in segregation. So by 1965, yes, segregation is dismantled, just like at the end of the Civil War, yes, you're no longer a slave, but then the issue is how you're gonna f support yourself. At the end of segregation, yes, there's no longer segregation, but how are, you gonna, how are you going to be as a community lifted back up? Then you have whole periods of time benign neglect and then we never got back on that wagon again and this this insidious idea that everything had been handled no everything was not yet handled the situation was not yet completed and then what happened was that in many ways we've actually moved backwards because that's how history is. History is not necessarily, listen, we know this in our own personal lives, and it's true in a culture or society as well. You don't necessarily go like this, and then higher, and then higher, and then higher. Sometimes you take one step forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back. And that is what has happened in race in America, because in many ways we've gone backwards. Criminal justice system in the United States, especially with the beginning of the, of the crime bill, the end of of welfare as we know it, all of that that happened. We now have a situation where if a white person is indicted for a crime and a black person is indicted for a crime, statistically, the black person will get around 20% longer time in prison if they are convicted than will a white person. Or you look at the issue of drugs. Um, white people statistically, white people and black people use drugs, same rate, but a black person is going to be tried and convicted for a drug crime far more often than a white person, et cetera. I, I, I don't think any of us have to be convinced of the lack of justice towards uh, black people in our criminal justice system. And at this point, every politician talks about systemic racism. It is so time to stop just talking about systemic racism and do something about it. And these things compound, not only the lack of economic justice, when you have, you know, one of the things I talked about on the um, campaign, uh, because this thing is such a whole systems breakdown, it has to be addressed on many different levels. That's why I talk not only about reparations, but I also talk about a Department of Children and Youth. We have millions of children who go to school, because remember, our schools, this is so unethical, so immoral, but our public school system, for the most part, is supported by property taxes. So that means that when you have a, an economically disadvantaged neighborhood, and yes, a black person in America, next to Native Americans, is the most likely to be living in a disadvantaged neighborhood because of the things that we're talking about here. We have millions of American children who go to school in classrooms where they don't even have the adequate school supplies to teach a child to read. And if a child cannot learn to read by the age of eight, the chances of high school graduation are drastically decreased and the chances of incarceration are drastically increased. I'd also like to remind you, when I was in college, there were about 300,000 people incarcerated in the United States. Now, what is called our prison industrial complex is such that we have 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States, and of course, mainly black and Latino people, all because of these systemic uh, issues of racism. So even when they talk about giving money to historically black colleges, there are so many millions of people, you have to, have to, you have to know how to read, you have to know how to, uh, uh, you have to be at a certain stage of, of, of your educational development to go to college to begin with. If you were a child who went to a school where they didn't teach you to read by the age of eight, you're much more likely to end up in prison than to end up in a historically black college. And that's also a reason why I stress in my campaign the difference between race-based policies and reparations. Race-based policies it's a continuation of a certain paternalistic attitude. We mess with you, yes, but this is how we'll fix you. Reparations is something different. This is the, there's a moral authority to reparations. Uh, after World War II, uh, Germany has paid $89 billion to Jewish organizations uh, in reparations. Reparations, it, it carries an inherent mea culpa. We get that we owe you this. That's why I said in the second debate, this is not charity. This is payment for a debt owed. Um, 
what the number I ended up throwing out was 500 billion. Some people, listen, in this conversation, there are always going to be people who say whatever number you say in terms of reparations, some will say it's too much, some will say it's too little. I certainly think it's a it's an appropriate number to throw out, put, put it on the table, let's start talking. And that's an extremely important issue of reparations. Enough with the forums and enough with the commissions. You know, be, beware when a, when a politician says we need to have a commission and study it. How much more do we need to study about this? What we need is moral clarity. That's what we need. We know the facts. Let's have some moral clarity and let's get move, move on from the atonement. It's one thing to atone in your heart. But I'll tell you something, if you owe me $1,000, as much as I appreciate the apology, I'd like my $1,000 back. And so reparations, my plan was, um, a, a reparations council of black leaders from all across different areas uh, in America today, cultural, academic, political, who would be tasked uh, over a 20 year period with the disbursement of this $500 billion. How they do it, what they do with that money, whether it's historically black colleges, whether it has to do with real estate buys. You know, one of the things I saw and became very aware of on my, in my campaign was the issue of gentrification. Well, you know, a lot of people think, well, it's really healing the situation to say, let's say some older woman has lived alone in an apartment in a neighborhood that has become gentrified and she can no longer afford her apartment. I don't think it's going far enough to say, well, she can't be kicked out. What's going far enough is if you have such a number on the table that you have uh, a committee, part of the reparations council of black real estate moguls who decide which of those blocks perhaps we're going to buy. If you owe people money, you don't get to tell them how to spend it. That's why I feel so strongly about reparations. Not that reparations is going to fix everything. You know, reparations to Jewish organizations after World War II doesn't mean that the Holocaust didn't happen. But it's gone far towards establishing real reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Europe. And that war ended in, eight, in, in 1945. We're talking about a war that ended in 1865. And we're still carrying this toxicity. And I've been talking about this since the since since my book, Healing the Soul of America, came out in 1997. Because this is a, a cancer that has been with us. Now, what's happening now with the riots, etc., it's a stage four cancer, but it's been a stage one for a long time. When everybody was saying during the, during the, um, the late 90s, everything's so good, I was writing and saying, Isn't, doesn't that depend on where you live? Um, so right now, the whole thing has exploded, obviously. And I don't know what geniuses thought that you could have a pattern, an established pattern of the execution of unarmed black men. And there not come a point where people are going to rise up. What was the political establishment thinking, on the right or the left, that this could just go on? And no, I don't want to hear politicians just say, we, need, we, we want a resolution to condemn police brutality. Are you kidding me? How about end police brutality? And at this point, the political establishment needs to understand it has lost this round. And it has lost this round for good reason. My father always told us we're going to lose in Vietnam because God's not on our side. Liberty and justice for all. When I was a little girl, we all put our hands in front of our hearts. One nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And I remember years ago when I was a young woman, I said to a friend, why aren't kids saying the Pledge of Allegiance a lot like we did when we were kids every morning? And he started yelling, because there's no fucking liberty and justice for all in this country. And I thought to myself, but the fact that when I was a little girl, I put my hand in front of my heart and I pledged allegiance to that ideal. That's what's exceptional about America is the ideal. But we have to embody the ideal. We're not embodying it now. And when we see places where we're not embodying it, our Pledge of Allegiance should be to fixing that. And, and other generations have. You know, abolition grew out of the early evangelicals in New Hampshire and the Quakers. Many of the leaders of the, uh, of the women's suffragette movement were Quakers, so dedicated to the inner light by which we are all one before God. And of course, the civil rights movement was led by a Baptist preacher. None of this, what, what does religion have to do with this? Are you kidding me? Religion, spirituality are about conscience. 
And it's not enough for us to live lives where we try to do the right thing and live according to the dictates of conscience in our personal lives. We must also, as citizens, take responsibility for the fact that public policy should also have a conscience. Public policy should also be driven by ethics and morality. And no, certain moral issues are not relativistic. They are pretty objective. Treat people right. Help people thrive. Many, many people in this country, many of them black, but many of them white as well, couldn't afford $400 unexpected expenditure even before the pandemic happened. We had 93 million people even before the pandemic living in poverty. There is so much corruption in our political system that has now become a little more than a handmaiden to the undue influence of corporate forces who place their financial interests of their stockholders before anything else and now just have such undue influence on our government. The corruption is so rife. And at this point, I heard Cornel West say on TV the other day, he's absolutely right, the system has proven it is incapable of reforming itself. It's time for the people to step in. And it's time for the political class to know you lost this round and you lost it for a reason. Your job now, put a plan on the table. Nothing else is going to fix this. I hope you heard me, Joe Biden and all of you. Put a plan on the table. No more forums, no more just talking to each other about it. Let's do something. It's not enough to just listen. We have to do something about what we heard. And we know that, we know who Donald Trump is now, but we still have a Congress. That's why it's so important that we stand up for progressive candidates in the, in the congressional races. It's up to us now, the people of the United States. And I know that some really bad actors have infiltrated the, the protests, but that does not of itself undermine the moral legitimacy of those protests. And that's why our founders gave us the right. Remember the founders, we were born of this un unbelievable dichotomy. On one hand, we were founded on the most enlightened aspirational principles of, of equality, that any country was ever founded on. And at the same time, 41 of the 56 signers were, were slave owners. So that dichotomy has always been with us. It's baked into the cake. It's in our DNA. We've always been both. We've been a country founded and standing on the most enlightened principles of liberty and justice and equality. The idea that anyone should be able to thrive here. And we have also contained in every generation, ours no less than any other, forces that would even violently perpetrate transgression against those principles. And every generation decides what it stands for. There was abolition, excuse me, there was slavery, and then there was abolition. There was the denial of rights to women, oppression of women institutionally, and then there was the women's suffragette movement and waves of feminism. There was institutionalized white supremacy and segregation, and then there was the civil rights movement. It's our time now. Others have pushed back against institutionalized injustices. It's our turn now. We're not dealing with anything worse than they had to deal with. Let's just not be the first generation to wimp out on doing what it takes to make things right. And remember, whether it has to do with abolition, whether it has to do with civil rights, whether it has to do with women's suffrage, it did not emanate from the government. These movements emanated from the people and the government follow. It's our time. It's our time as the American people to rise up, to face the challenge, to push back the forces of institutionalized oppression that are holding people down in our time. And I think that knowing the whole story and what has happened in the past is very empowering. If we deepen our thoughts and we expand our hearts, and we all find within ourselves more courage than maybe we've displayed so far. We'll do in our time what other generations did in theirs. And on the other side of this, we'll know, yeah, we did it. The country will be better. And so will we. God bless.